difficult to believe that in Davos today, we're talking about war. Because the Davos spirit is the antithesis of war. It is about forging ties and together finding solutions for the big challenges of the world. You might remember, and you worked on it together with us, that in recent years, we have looked at smart and sustainable ways to fight climate change and how to shape globalization so that all can benefit. How to make digitalization a force for good and mitigate its risks for democracies. So Davos is all about crafting a better future together. That is what we should be ta talking here about today. But instead, we must address the cost and consequences of Putin's war of choice. The playbook of Russia's aggression against Ukraine comes straight out of another century, treating millions of people, not as human beings, but as faceless populations to be moved or controlled or set as a buffer between military forces, trying to trample the aspiration of an entire nation with tanks. This is not just a matter of Ukraine's survival. This is not just an issue of European security. This is putting our whole international order into question. And that's why countering Russia's aggression is a task for the entire global community. Ukraine must win this war. And Putin's aggression must be a strategic failure. So we will do everything we can to help Ukrainians prevail and retake the future into their hands. For the first time in history, the European Union is providing military aid to country under attack. We are mobilizing our full economic power. Our sanctions and the self-sanctionings of companies themselves are draining Russia's economy and thus draining the Kremlin's war machine. Our member states are caring for six million Ukrainian refugees and actually there are eight million internally displaced people in Ukraine itself. And in parallel, Ukraine needs direct budget support now to keep the economy running. It's about pensions, it's about salaries, it's about the basic services that have to be provided. And therefore, we have proposed a 10 billion euros macrofinancial assistance. It is the largest package of macrofinancial assistance ever conceived by the European Union for a third country. Other countries, starting with our friends in the United States, are doing their utmost too. It is an economic relief operation with no precedent in recent history. But that is the short term, and much more needs to be done. So with the same resolve, we will, hand in hand, help Ukraine rise from the ashes. That's the idea behind the reconstruction platform that I proposed to President Zelensky. You remember that yesterday, in his speech here in Davos, he recognized the unprecedented unity of the democratic world, the understanding that freedom must be fought for. So the rebuilding of Ukraine also calls for an unprecedented unity. As President Zelensky said, the work that has to be done is colossal. But together, we can and we will master the challenge. And that is why I have proposed this reconstruction platform to be led by Ukraine 
and the European Commission because we will combine reform with investment. The platform invites global contributions from any country that cares about the future of Ukraine, from international financial institutions, from the private sector. We need everyone on board. And I was very glad to hear about the Lugano Initiative yesterday. Borge Brende called it a Marshall Plan for Ukraine. And, ladies and gentlemen, we should leave no stone unturned. That is including, if possible, the Russian assets that we have frozen. But this is not only about undoing the damage of Putin's destructive fury. It is also about building the future that Ukrainians have chosen themselves. For years now, the people of Ukraine have worked for change. And that is why they elected Volodymyr Zelensky in the first place. The reconstruction of the country should combine massive investment with ambitious reforms. For example, to modernize Ukraine's administrative capacity, to firmly establish the rule of law and the independence of the judiciary, to fight corruption, get rid of the oligarchs, to build a fair, sustainable and strong, competitive economy, and thus to firmly support Ukraine in pursuing its European path. Ukraine belongs into the European family. Ukrainians have stood tall in the face of brutal violence. They have stood for their own freedom, but also for our values and for humanity. So we stand with them, and I think this is a defining moment for all democracies on the whole globe. Ladies and gentlemen, this conflict is also sending shockwaves throughout the world, further disrupting supply chains already stretched by the pandemic. It is putting new burdens on businesses and households, and it has created a thick fog of uncertainty for investors across the globe. And more and more companies and countries already battered by two years of COVID-19 and all the resulting supply chain issues must now cope with rising price energy, prices for energy as a direct result of Putin's unpardonable war. And Russia has tried to put pressure on us for example, by cutting the energy supplies, the gas supplies of Bulgaria, Poland, and now lately Finland. But this war and this behavior we see has only strengthened Europe's resolve to get rid of Russian fossil fuel dependency rapidly. The climate cannot wait, but now the geopolitical reasons are evident too. We have to diversify away from fossil fuels. We have set our course already towards climate neutrality, so now we must accelerate our clean energy transition. And fortunately, we are already having in place the means to do so. The European Green Deal is already ambitious, but now we are taking our ambition yet to another level. Last week, the European Commission tabled and proposed Repower EU. That is our 300 billion euro plan to phase out of, fossil, of Russian fossil fuels and fast forward the green transition. And today, if we look at the share of renewables we have in Europe, almost a quarter of the energy we consume in Europe 
stems from renewable sources already. This is the famous European Green Deal. But now, through Repower EU, we will practically double this share to 45% in 2030. This is only possible by also bringing cross-border cooperation to a new level. Take, for example, the North Sea of Europe and what is happening there. Last week, we had four European member states joining forces to harness the energy of offshore wind, and they decided to quadruple their offshore wind capacity by 2030. That will mean wind farms in the North Sea will cover the annual energy consumption of more than 50 million homes. This is roughly one quarter of all European households. This is the right way to go. Renewable energy is basically our springboard towards net zero CO2 emissions. And it is good for the climate, but it is also good for our independence and for our security of energy supply. The same is true for the diversification of our gas supply. This is another pillar of Repower EU. As we speak, Europe is concluding new arrangements with reliable, trustworthy suppliers all over the world. In March, I agreed with President Biden to significantly step up LNG deliveries from the United States to the European Union. The amount will replace around about one-third of the Russian gas we have today. More LNG pipeline gas will also come from the Middle East and North Africa. New LNG terminals in Greece, in Cyprus and in Poland will soon become operational, as will new interconnectors. And important is that the connecting pipeline infrastructure will then over time form the core of our hydrogen corridors. Hydrogen, ladies and gentlemen, is the new frontier of Europe's energy network. But we must also think further ahead. The economies of the future will no longer rely on oil and coal, but on lithium for batteries, on silicon metal for chips, on rare earth permanent magnets for electric vehicles, and wind turbines. And it's sure, the green and digital transition will massively increase our need for these materials. However, if we look at where we are today, access to these materials is not at all a given. For many of them, we rely on a handful of producers all over the world. So we must avoid falling into the same trap as with oil and gas. We should not replace all dependencies with new ones. We are therefore working to ensure the resilience of our supply chains. And again, strong international partnerships are at the heart of the solution. So the Commission has already secured strategic raw material partnerships with countries, for example, like Canada, and additional reliable partnerships will follow. Once again, together we can create more balanced interdependencies and build supply chains that we can really trust. Ladies and gentlemen, we are witnessing how Russia is weaponizing its energy supplies. And indeed, this is having global repercussions. Unfortunately, we are seeing the same pattern emerging in food security. Ukraine is one of the world's most fertile countries and even its flag symbolizes the most common Ukrainian landscape, 
a yellow field of grain under blue, blue sky. Now, those fields of grain have been scorched. In Russian occupied Ukraine, the Kremlin's army is confiscating grain stocks and machinery. For some, this brought back memories from a dark past, the times of the Soviets, crop seizures, and the devastating famine of the 1930s. Today, Russia's artillery is bombarding grain warehouses in Ukraine, deliberately. And Russians' warships in the Black Sea are blockading Ukrainian ships full of wheat and sunflower seeds. The consequences of these shameful acts are there for everyone to see. Global wheat prices are skyrocketing, and it's the fragile countries and vulnerable populations that suffer the most. Bread prices in Lebanon have increased by 70 percent, and food shipments from Odessa could not reach Somalia. And on top of this, Russia is now hoarding its own food exports as a form of blackmail, holding back supplies to increase global prices or trading wheat in exchange for political support. This is using hunger and grain to wield power. And again, our answer is and must be to mobilize greater collaboration and support at the European and global level. First, Europe is working hard to get grain to global markets out of Ukraine. You must know that there are currently 20 million tons of wheat stuck in Ukraine. The usual export in Ukraine was 5 million tons per month. Now it is down to 200,000 to 1 million tons. By getting it out, we can provide Ukrainians with the needed revenues and the World Food Program with supplies it so badly needs. So to do this, we are opening solidarity lines, we are linking Ukraine's borders to our ports, we are financing different modes of transportation so that Ukraine's grain can reach the most vulnerable countries in the world. Second, we're stepping up our own production to ease pressure on global food markets. And we are working with the World Food Programme so that available stocks and additional countries are able to reach the products who have the products at affordable prices. Global cooperation is the antidote against Russia's blackmail. Third, we're supporting Africa in becoming less dependent on food imports. Only 50 years ago, Africa produced all the food it needed. For centuries, countries like Egypt were the granaries of the world. Then climate change made water scarce, and the desert swallowed hundreds of kilometers of fertile land year after year. Today, Africa is heavily dependent on food imports, and this makes it vulnerable. Therefore, an initiative to boost Africa's own production capacity will be critical to strengthen the continent's resilience. The challenge is to adapt farming to a warmer and drier age. So innovative technologies will be crucial to leapfrog. Companies around the world are already testing high-tech solutions for climate-smart agriculture. For example, precision irrigation, operating on power from renewable, or vertical farming, or nanotechnologies, which can cut the use of fossil fuels to produce fertilizers. Ladies and gentlemen, the signs of a growing food crisis 
are obvious. We have to act urgently. But there are also solutions today and on the horizon. And this is why, again, cooperation. I am working with President al-Sisi to address the repercussions of the war with an event on food security and the solutions coming from Europe and the region. It is time to end the unhealthy dependencies. It is time to create new connections. It is time to replace the old chains with new bonds. So let's overcome these huge challenges in cooperation. And that is in Davos spirit. Thank you for your attention. And you've just been listening to Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, addressing delegates at the World Economic Forum meeting in Davos, Switzerland, on day two. Uh, Ursula von der Leyen there uh, noting that Ukraine is part of the European community, very much so. She said it's part of the Euro Ukraine belongs in the European family. She says that the war in Ukraine puts the whole international order into question. And she called for global cooperation in responding to the war. She emphasized the need for the world to cooperate in helping Ukraine rebuild its economy. And she made it very clear that the efforts for reconstruction and rebuilding in Ukraine, the money that would be put towards that, would be linked to a need for reform. She talked about getting rid of the oligarchs, uh, fighting corruption, and uh, establishing the rule of law. She also emphasized the importance of weaning Europe off of uh, Russian energy supplies and the need to, uh, for the world to come together in assuring that the food supply, particularly for vulnerable countries, is guaranteed in light of Ukraine losing its ability to export its grain. And she accused Russia of using hunger uh, as a as a way of wielding power, exploiting the uh, the disruption of supply chains uh, for the for food. If you're just joining us, we're looking at special coverage from Davos, Switzerland. Uh, we have two important speeches taking place there today. We just heard from the president of the, of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen. And we are going to be hearing in a little while from Jens Stoltenberg, the chief of NATO. We expect that address to be coming up uh, within the next uh, few minutes. Uh, joining me in Davos, we have our correspondent Ben Fazulin, and in the studio with me is our chief political correspondent Melinda Crane. Let's go first to Davos, where Ben Fazulin is standing by to get your reaction. Ben, I know that you were following Ursula von der Leyen's speech. You were there yesterday, too, when the Ukrainian president, uh, Zelensky, addressed the forum. What did you make of what Ursula von der Leyen has to say? Very strong words from Ursula von der Leyen saying that Ukraine must win this war and that the EU was doing everything it can to, uh, to help uh, as far as military assistance goes, financial aid and sanctions. Uh, two words were missing, though, Terry, and they were oil embargo. Uh, this is something that a lot of people here in Davos are talking about. A lot of people have uh, different solutions to the problems there because, of course, it is an economic balancing act when you're so dependent on Russia for your oil and gas. And that is what the situation is for Hungary, for Portugal, uh, both of whom are against an oil embargo at the moment. Germany, though, has had a massive turnaround. Germany economy minister Robert Habeck has signaled that we could see an oil embargo, an agreement on that within the uh, EU over the next coming days. That would be a massive breakthrough. Um, whether or not that happens is, is still to be seen. There would be cheers here throughout the mountain, no doubt, because it would starve uh, Mr. Putin of his funds uh, which directly fund this war. Uh, the only problem is, according to Robert Habeck, is that oil prices continue to surge, and that also continues to help uh, Vladimir Putin and his war. So an oil cap would be needed, and that would need agreement from countries around the world. So an even bigger step 
but something that could also be possible, considering the extreme amount of unity we're seeing around the world, Terry, and here in Davos. Melinda, uh, as Ben said, we did not hear those words, oil embargo. We did hear the uh, Ursula von der Leyen saying that, that Europe needs to definitely wean itself off of Russian energy. Uh, much of what she was saying, of course, was directed to the delegates there in Davos, world leaders, many world leaders represented there, the business community, of course, too. But her words seemed to also be directed uh, to Kiev, too, uh, as a response to Zelensky yesterday uh, and giving well, many words of encouragement for Ukraine. In fact, uh, it's clear that the Ukrainian leadership that is speaking here in Davos and that is, is playing a very prominent role is eager to present a new picture of Ukraine itself, to change the narrative on Ukraine, uh, if you would. And in fact, when the EU Commission Vice President, uh, President uh, von der Leyen, spoke here about how the EU is working together with Ukraine to promote reform, uh, to end uh, corruption, uh, to push back against uh, uh, oligarchs. That is absolutely part of that narrative. And therefore, that strong statement, Ukraine is part of the European family, of course, goes to the issue of Ukraine's uh, eventual membership in the EU. And indeed, she is working there also to change that story about Ukraine. The other thing that absolutely stood out for me here, though, is her words, Ukraine must win this war. Because we are seeing an incipient debate as it becomes clear that this is going to be a war of attrition, it's going to go on for some time, about the degree to which Western countries will remain resolute and committed. And she listed a whole number of positive initiatives that the EU has been taking from its first time ever uh, support of uh, military assistance directly to Ukraine, to efforts to keep uh, the budget uh, of Ukraine afloat through macrofinancial assistance, and of course reconstruction as she said. But I think what she makes clear with that statement, Ukraine must win this war, is that at least in Europe, the resolve will not weaken to keep that up. Whereas, of course, we have seen even the editorial board of the New York Times saying maybe the U.S. needs to reconsider how far and how long it will go with its commitment. So she is essentially also pushing back there on that narrative, saying EU will remain supportive. But as we know, and as Ben just mentioned, there are divisions with the EU. For example, when it comes to the Russian oil embargo, it's said to be just days away. But again, uh, those divisions are something that the EU will continue to face going forward. An oil embargo, of course, is one thing. A gas embargo, quite, quite something else. Uh, Europe heavily dependent, uh, Germany in particular, a few other countries. Um, ben, coming back to you, what sort of reaction are you hearing from the delegates there in Davos? to the discussions about supporting Ukraine in its reconstruction efforts, maybe not so much on the military side, but there's talk of a monumental, a colossal task, uh, that was the word that both Zelensky and von der Leyen used in trying to rebuild the country that's going to require an, a monumental amount of capital, a lot of help from outside. What are you hearing from the business community there represented in Davos and, and of course, uh, country, leaders of different countries as well when it comes to tackling that task? Well, it would literally be like uh, the Commission President said, rising uh, Ukraine from the ashes. The, that country uh, has been reduced to rubble in so many places, in so many towns and cities. I was talking to a doctor yesterday from Mariupol who uh, left her hospital and walked 20 kilometers through rubble and shelling to then be picked up and rescued and taken out of the country. Um, and she was, she was a mess. She was shell-shocked. Um, the investors here see a, a huge opportunity, Terry. I mean, uh, from year to year here in Davos, it's from one thing to the next. It's from uh, big data, investing in the cloud, cryptocurrencies, and the next big thing is Ukraine, which is sad to say the, the horrors of Ukraine are being presented here to investors time and again and reminded that how, what is going on and how terrible it is, but it is also a huge business opportunity. And 
what we could see here is a whole new Ukraine, a green Ukraine, a new model for the world, a new energy partner for Germany. Ukraine has huge wind resources. The country has doubled the size geographically um, of Germany. And it's in a great location. Um, it could supply Europe with so much green energy, with hydrogen, green hydrogen. You heard that mentioned by the uh, Commission President just then. It was also mentioned by Zelensky yesterday in his address. Uh, there's a lot that Ukraine has to offer as well. All this discussion about reconstruction, of course, in Ukraine is predicated on the notion that Russia will be kept at bay somehow, that, uh, r that the country will be, have sufficient security that will accommodate that kind of reconstruction. So when we heard from Ursula von der Leyen there, we, talk, we did hear a lot about reconstruction. We also heard about Russia, about Russia's aggression and the need to, to uh, address that aggression, respond to it in some way. Um, we heard President Zelensky addressing the forum yesterday, again calling for more sanctions, more embargo for the withdrawal of all business interests uh, from Russia by the international community. Another avenue is to use Russian assets abroad to, to help the reconstruction effort and to support Ukraine. Uh, that was referred to as well by Ursula von der Leyen just now. Uh, that's really just a possibility. It's only Absolutely. being discussed at this point. Absolutely. But she mentioned it. And that's something. And we will certainly hear increasing talk uh, about that because, of course, there are many Russian assets that have been impounded now all over the world. Yachts, uh, just for one example. Yachts uh, that, as was said yesterday at Davos, in their tonnage, uh, in their value, exceed the value of the entire Russian Navy. Uh, it's uh, absurd. Therefore, there is talk about trying to use these assets. There are also proposals being floated, for example, by Estonia's uh, Premier Kaya Kallas to try to perhaps create an escrow account when the EU is paying for Russian gas, to create an escrow account that, uh, that would hold back a portion of those payments to be used for reconstruction in Ukraine. Quite a creative idea. She hasn't got full buy-in yet within, within the EU, but Again, that goes in the same direction because what we are seeing in the moment is that although the Russian economy is certainly taking a hit from the sanctions, it is also profiting from rising oil and gas prices. And that is a great irony that, uh, in fact, at the very moment when people are trying to wean themselves off of Russian oil and gas, it becomes more uh, expensive and feeds more money into that war machine uh, that, the, uh, that the commission president mentioned. So again, there will be pressure to try to work against that. Okay, we're going to cut back straight to Davos again, where Jens Stoltenberg, the chief of the NATO military alliance, is being introduced at this point. Uh, if you're just joining us, you are watching special coverage on DW News of the addresses by the European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen. She spoke just a few minutes ago, and now we're about to hear from Jens Stoltenberg, the, uh, the head of NATO. It is therefore my Let's listen pleasure in. to invite you to the stage to share with our audience here in Davos and globally your vision on the impacts of the war in Ukraine and the long-term implications on the world of strategic competition. Welcome, Mr. Secretary General. Many thanks, uh, Berge. It's great to be back here in Davos and to see you all in person after two years without uh, this uh, gathering. For half a century, the World Economic Forum has brought uh, the global community together to exchange ideas, insights and uh, solutions on some of the world's most important uh, difficult uh, problems. Today, we need the spirit of Davos even more. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> President Putin's war on Ukraine has shattered peace in Europe. It is really a game changer, not just for European security, but for a global order. 
NATO has two fundamental tasks in response to Russia's aggression. Providing support to Ukraine and preventing the war from escalating. For many years, NATO and NATO allies have supported Ukraine. In particular, the United States, Canada, the United Kingdom, and also Turkey. Providing equipment and training for tens of thousands of Ukrainian soldiers. We see the difference this is making every day on the battlefield. Since Russia's invasion, we have significantly stepped up our support with billions of dollars of weapons and other assistance to help Ukraine uphold its right to self-defense, enshrined in the UN Charter. NATO's main responsibility is to protect all allies and prevent this war from escalating, causing even greater death and destruction. We may have been shocked by Russia's brutal invasion, but we should not be surprised. This invasion was one of the best predicted acts of military aggression ever. In NATO, we shared intelligence and we made the intelligence public for many months to warn about Putin's plans. Russia's attack on Ukraine is part of a pattern of many years, where Moscow uses military force to achieve its political games, aims. The destruction of Grozny, the invasion of Georgia, the annexation of Crimea, the bombing of Aleppo, and now the war in Ukraine. Since the first invasion of Ukraine in 2014, NATO has been adapting and preparing with increased defense spending and invested in modern capabilities. We deployed combat ready battle groups in the eastern part of our alliance for the first time in our history. We increased the readiness of our forces and established new defense domains, including space and cyberspace. When Russia invaded Ukraine again this year, NATO was ready. We deployed additional forces to the east of our alliance. Today we have over 40,000 troops under direct NATO command, backed by significant air and naval assets. We doubled the number of multinational battle groups from the Baltic to the Black Sea. And we have 100,000 troops on high alert, ready to respond to any aggression and to defend every inch of NATO territory. This is deterrence to remove any room for misunderstanding or miscalculation in Moscow. Not to provoke a conflict, but to prevent the conflict and preserve peace. Last December, President Putin presented an ultimatum to NATO. He demanded a legally binding treaty to rewrite the security architecture in Europe to re-establish spheres of influence, to force NATO to withdraw from the eastern part of our alliance, and to end NATO enlargement. He wanted less NATO on his borders and launched a war. Now he's getting more NATO on his borders and more members. Finland and Sweden's decision to apply for NATO membership is historic. It demonstrates that European security will not be dictated by violence 
and intimidation. All allies agree that NATO enlargement has been a great success, spreading freedom and democracy across Europe. So I'm confident that we will be able to find a way to address all allies' security concerns and welcome NATO's closest partners into our family of free nations. In the meantime, NATO is vigilant in the Baltic Sea region. Allies have increased their presence. We have stepped up exercises and deployments, and for the first time ever, a US amphibious ready group has been placed under NATO command. Finland and Sweden's membership would also strengthen the close bond between NATO and the European Union. European security and transatlantic security are deeply intertwined. Today, close to 600 million Europeans live in a NATO country, and 93% of the EU population is protected by NATO. The ever closer coordination between NATO and the European Union has been critical for dealing with the current crisis. And as you just heard from Ursula von der Leyen, NATO allies and the European Union have imposed unprecedented sanctions on Putin's war machine. Countries from Switzerland to South Korea have joined us and also applied sanctions. And hundreds of international companies have pulled out of Russia. These massive sanctions remind us of one of the important lessons from this conflict. That we should not trade long-term security needs for short-term economic interests. The war in Ukraine demonstrates how economic relations with authoritarian regimes can create vulnerabilities. Over-reliance on the import of key commodities like energy. Risks created by exporting advanced technologies like artificial intelligence. And weakened resilience caused by foreign control of a critical infrastructure like 5G. This is about Russia, but also about China, another authoritarian regime that does not share our values and that undermines the rules-based international order. International trade has undoubtedly brought great prosperity. I, and many of us here today, including Børge Brenda, have worked hard to promote a more globalized economy. But we must recognize that our economic choices have consequences for our security. Freedom is more important than free trade. The protection of values is more important than profit. At the NATO summit in Madrid next month, NATO leaders will make bold decisions to continue to strengthen and adapt our lines for this more dangerous and competitive world. The conflict in Ukraine has underlined the importance of Europe and North America standing together in NATO and are working with our like-minded partners around the world to defend our values and promote peace and prosperity. In the spirit of Davos, I count on you too. Thank you. And you just...
hearing NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg addressing the uh, World Economic Forum in Davos, you, Switzerland. Uh, uh, in his speech, uh, he General. outlined how and NATO is to responding to the war in Ukraine. He, uh, he noted how the help that NATO has already been providing for Ukraine, the training of its troops, for example, for the past few years is now paying off in the battlefield. He, uh, he also emphasized the steps that NATO is taking to, to strengthen the allies, noting that uh, NATO's most important task is to protect NATO allies and its second uh, priority being to prevent escalation. This was after he also noted earlier that providing support to Ukraine is among NATO's key tasks. With me uh, in the studio is Melinda Crane. She's our chief political correspondent. She was following that, uh, that speech by Jens Stoltenberg uh, very carefully. And of course, the speech just before that, uh, during the past hour, with Ursula von der Leyen, the uh, president of the European Commission. Melinda, let me get your first reactions to what Jens Stoltenberg said there. He, uh, he painted a very broad picture of support, of course, for Ukraine, for uh, NATO allies, protecting NATO allies. But he expanded uh, to very much a, a global uh, perspective uh, concerning what the implications of the war in Ukraine are for the international community. Absolutely. I think for me that was the message that most stood out, probably because we know the other messages that he gave about the need to continue supporting Ukraine and also the need to ensure uh, deterrence, including by taking Sweden and Finland into NATO. What stood out there, by the way, uh, he did not mention, of course, Turkey and uh, the pushback from Turkey on, uh, on welcoming those two, but tried to express confidence that their uh, application for membership will, in fact, go through. But what really stood out was for me that last part of the speech where he called into question what has really been the credo for Davos. Davos is the venue for the international elite of globalization, all of whom long subscribed to the view that everyone should trade with everyone regardless of political, uh, the political values and that that would create a rising tide that would lift all boats. And he is saying that that belief no longer uh, holds and that, as he put it, uh, the, we must not trade long-term security needs for short-term short economic interests, of course, men mentioning there the vulnerabilities created by dependence on Russian fossil fuels. Uh, that was also mentioned by the EU Commission President. But going beyond that to talk about exporting artificial intelligence, about uh, depending on other uh, autocratic countries for uh, 5G, and then essentially said, and this is also about China. So what we're seeing is the rise of what's sometimes called the strategic autonomy debate, the idea that Western countries need to look toward greater resilience, uh, to uh, look toward uh, at least diversifying supply chains away from dependence on countries that are going in an autocratic uh, direction, and that that includes, as the EU Commission president said, that includes critical minerals that we're going to need for renewable energies and digitalization. So we're seeing here in motion in Davos a reconsideration of the idea of globalization and perhaps uh, to some degree a move toward the idea that the global trading system will become a system of blocks uh, where countries, like-minded countries, trade with one another but seek to reduce their dependence on others. In Davos we have Ben Fazulin, our correspondent, standing by. He's uh, been there since the beginning. This is day two now. He was there also yesterday when the forum was addressed uh, with the opening address by Volodymyr Zelensky, the president of Ukraine. Uh, ben, I wanted to, to put to you something that Jens Stoltenberg, the NATO chief, said just a few moments ago. He said, our economic choices have consequences for our, our security. Uh, what sort of message does that give to the business elite represented there in Davos? That was a direct message to the business elite here in Davos, that's for sure. Um, he was talking about the protection of our values being more important than profit. And uh, for so many years, uh, people have turned a blind eye to uh, what's going on in different parts of the world, especially 
China. We were talking about artificial intelligence just before. China is the leader in artificial intelligence. China is the provider of so many new technologies, uh, robotics, not just AI, but all sorts of different sectors right now where they're leading, where they've developed amazing uh, systems, but are also implementing those systems uh, all around the world. It's something that we have to think about when it comes to our security, what's more important. And uh, I think the business community is going to start listening and thinking about that, because if the world does start getting divided up into new regional spheres of influence or new blocks, as Melinda said, then trade will be very different. It's going to be about building bridges, not just between two big blocks like it was back in the Cold War, but if we see a hot war developing here, then many little bridges uh, throughout the world, which is a lot more work, a lot more costly. But what's at stake here? Profits or our security? Melinda, uh, we also heard Jan Stoltenberg say that it's very much a priority for NATO not to provoke further conflict with Russia. Yet here in Germany, there is a great deal of discussion about whether that is indeed what NATO might be doing. And there's a certain reluctance on behalf of the government also with the idea of not wanting to further provoke Russia. Uh, what's, how do you think that message about not wanting to provoke Russia is going to be going to go down here in Germany? I think uh, it will fall both uh, on uh, the ears that find it eminently reasonable and there will be others who will continue to question it because, of course, Germany has uh, – there, there is a lot of fear in this country. The chancellor said at the very outset of the war that he was getting hundreds of emails every day from people who worried about World War III. And, of course, Germany was in many ways uh, – ground zero in the Cold War. It was here that the short-range missiles were stationed. Uh, it was here that uh, Russian forces would have come through the Fulda Gap. So the fears and concerns of many German citizens are something that the government here in Berlin must take seriously. And yet we've heard enormous, uh, true, resolute support on the part of, for example, the Green Party members of the coalition who say we cannot be governed by fear. We must uh, seek uh, to uh, protect and prevent, as uh, Jens Stoltenberg has just uh, communicated it. So I think that we will see ongoing uncertainty amongst some Germans and some members of the coalition, but we will also see that, that uh, resolute determination to move forward together with other Western countries. Melinda, thank you very much. Our chief political correspondent, uh, Melinda Crane. Uh, and in Davos, I want to say thanks, of course, to Ben Vazulin, our correspondent, who has been following that all along and will continue uh, following talks there for us as we proceed. Um, just to give you a quick recap of what's been going on here during the past hour, we've heard both from Ursula von der Leyen, the president of the European Commission, and Jens Stoltenberg, the, uh, the secretary general of NATO, the Defense Alliance, addressing delegates at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland.